Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta. And before we get started on tonight's story, I'm just gonna tell you about one quick thing, and that's the Chilling app. Talk about the Chilling app a little bit here and there, but it's worth repeating. The Chilling app is a new app that's available on iPhone and on Android, and allows you to listen to narrations, like you're doing right now, like from me, but also from many of my friends and other narrators on YouTube, such as people like Autumn Ivy. Not just that, but the Chilling app has many exclusive stories directly to it, as well as an awesome feature that I will talk about every single time I talk about the Chilling app, and that's the ambient sound. Chilling has a lot of different features, but ambient sound I think is my favorite one because it allows you to set up your own background music and your own background sounds to create your own experience when listening to a narration. It makes it very different from listening here or on the podcast, and makes it very, very unique. Also, if you've been around here, you know that I'm a very big fan of virtual reality and VR in general because of, you know, my whole thing, the Horicon VR. Well, Chilling is being super cool with the holiday season and giving away a Quest 2 along with Resident Evil 4, Blair Witch Oculus Quest Edition, and the Exorcist Legion VR. If you want to get your hands on this, then check out the link in the description down below to the chillingapp.com slash quest giveaway, and you can be able to enter to win an Oculus Quest, which, you know probably one of the best ways to get introduced into VR these days. So that's all before we get started on tonight's compilation. A big thank you to Chilling App for sponsoring today's video. And now, on to tonight's story. I was headed towards the airport to catch a flight, driving down a country road that my GPS claimed would serve as a shortcut when my luck officially ran out. A sudden flat tire caused me to swerve off the road, slamming my rental car into the side of a tree. The airbags promptly deployed and made me fall unconscious. By the time I woke, I realized I had missed my flight. My cell phone service was shit, preventing me from being able to contact the airline and make an adjustment. So there I was, miles from where I was supposed to be without even a spare or a phone to call for. And there wasn't another vehicle to be seen on that dark highway. I was alone, and with no option but to walk. So, that's what I decided to do. My head still felt numb from the impact, my body was hurting, so I wasn't sure that I could make it far, but I was sure I had passed by a crossroads that marked a small rest stop of some sort, so I aimed for that direction. After about ten minutes of walking, I saw the sign and realized it was actually a mile marker for a township in the area. A small place called St. Lepaldi. Didn't sound familiar, but I figured my best option would be to head in that direction before I lost consciousness. The night seemed darker on this highway, and I felt tired, resting on the side of the road near a ditch as I felt the temperature begin to drop. The weather report had claimed the evening would be pleasant, but to be honest, so far it felt like one long headache. Before I knew what was happening, though, it became a nightmare. I heard this strange bellow coming from the nearby ditch, and it made my hair stand up on end. It sounded like a mixture between a cat and a wolf, and maybe an owl. I stood up and I looked towards the gully, trying to see if there was a wild animal somewhere nearby. The whole area seemed still and deserted, almost devoid of life. As I stood there, a chill filled the air, and I heard the noise again. This time I used my smartphone to peer into the ditch and get a better look. There was definitely something there. Some small creature that was crawling along in the mud, but it didn't look like any beast I was familiar with. As I shone the light on it, it turned its head toward me and I nearly dropped my phone. Its eyes, they, they looked human. In that unexpected moment, I scrambled away and moved towards the road, uncertain that I was safe there anymore. Whatever this thing was, I resolved to steer clear of the side road for the rest of the journey. But each few feet I moved, I swore I heard the creature follow, making its ominous, guttural noises as it crawled along. It felt its eyes were on me as I started to run down the street, desperate to get away from the unnerving thing. I wasn't sure if it was a demented individual or some kind of monster, but the thing moved at inhuman speeds. Even as I spotted a farmhouse on the side of the road and started to dash towards it, someone inside surely could help. I rushed to the doors, trying to make as much noise as I could, but the occupants must have been out for the night because nothing I did stirred them. Quickly, I decided to hide in the barn instead, hunkering down and watching as the shaggy creature approached. I could feel my entire body shivering as I caught a better glimpse of it. 
his hunched over form sneaking into the shed and watching as it crawled towards one of the cows. Before I knew what was happening, the creature attacked it, grabbing a hold of the bovine and tackling it to the ground. The large animal tried its best to fight, but but before long, the diminutive creature had somehow managed to turn it over entirely with its legs up and the confused farm animal moaning as it listened to the strange little creature begin to feast. It sounded like it was killing the cow, but I dare not move for fear that I'd be next. The crunching and grinding of the creature kept going for at least an hour as I hunkered down, finally satisfied and full of meat and milk. The shaggy, short cryptid crawled away, leaving me to hide in the hay bales. Truth be told, I was so terrified by what had happened to the cow, I wasn't sure if I felt safe to go anywhere. And I was also too exhausted, so I tried my best to get rest in the smelly barn. But it was better than whatever nightmare awaited me in the snow beyond. Somehow I managed to fall asleep, perhaps from the shock and the terror that I experienced, but in the morning my dilemma only worsened. I felt something nudge me in my backside, and I groggily awoke sometime after sunrise, staring up to see a dark-haired farmhand holding a sawed-off shotgun in my face. Instinctively, I raised my hands in defense, showing the worker I meant no harm, and they ordered me on my feet with a few harsh words I couldn't make out. It didn't sound like a language I was familiar with. Then they pointed their weapon towards the farmhouse, saying a few more strange things that I, I couldn't understand, but they got the impression that they wanted me to head inside. I obeyed immediately, my body too sore and tired from the night before to argue. Hopefully, whatever creature was lurking around would not still be here in the daylight, I thought to myself. As I crossed the yard towards the house, the unease I felt began to go away when I heard children laughing and saw normal people on the front porch. Well, I say normal, but truth be told, I could immediately gather that these folk were quaint, perhaps similar to Amish or Quakers in their quiet lifestyle. The children dispersed when they saw me, and the housewife went to go get her husband. I stood awkwardly there in the front yard for what felt like an eternity until they both returned. He was a well-dressed man in overalls with a brim hat and a long, scraggly beard. Typical attire for the two faiths that I assumed he identified with, but I didn't want to jump to any conclusions until I had a full story. You lost, son? He asked me. Before I even had a chance to respond, he raised his hand for me to come inside and offered, Wife just finished making us porridge for breakfast. Come sit us, Belle. Tell us how you came to our little town. As I ate the warm food, I recounted my tale to the couple, although I left out the parts where I had seen the strange creature that had attacked their cattle. I didn't want to seem insane, and I wasn't sure if the experience I had was actually even real. They sat and listened quietly, and the husband, running his fingers through his beard, thoughtfully as I concluded the story. Uh, you're lucky you found us. Winter comes quick around these parts, and it's harsh and it's cold. Any day now, the ground will be covered with snow, and travel will be impossible. You can stay with us as long as you like. You have plenty of room. It won't be very neighborly of us to send you away, he declared. The wife was nodding and bobbing her head in agreement as I checked my phone. Of course, no reception way out here. I shouldn't have been surprised. For all I knew, because of missing my flight, I had likely wound up losing that job. So a vacation in the sticks wasn't exactly on the agenda, but I figured it was better than drowning my sorrows in liquor back home. As we finished the meal, the couple instructed me to leave my bowl on the floor of the breakfast room, which I found a bit odd, but I did as they told me before I was shown the guest room. The wife rattled off a few rules, such as no food in bed, no candles burning at night. I figured they were just customs that related to traditions of their faith, so I told her I would try my best to remember. As I settled in, I looked out the window and saw just as they predicted. Winter clouds were forming over the farmland fast. Soon it would begin to snow ever so gently. And I saw the two of them out in the front yard apparently having an argument. As I watched the husband and the wife become more heated with one another until at last he announced he was going to town for a drink, 
after smacking her across the face. Somehow, despite the obvious patriarchal system I had seen so far, the act surprised me. This picture-perfect little slice of heaven seemed to have cracks after all, I thought. I also was certain I saw another shadowy, shaggy monster dragging a lamb off into the nearby woods. Poor tiny animal bleeding as the wife watched it happen impassively. Her face told me I wasn't simply seeing things. Whatever the strange troll was, it was real. I kept myself as busy as I could the remainder of the day, offering to help with chores and do anything that would keep my mind off the strange things happening around the area. But as the day lingered on, I saw more evidence something terrible and unnatural was occurring in this small town. I was helping put the dishes away for the midday meal when I grabbed the plate with some leftover chicken to throw it away, and, and the wife stopped me short. You mustn't bother, she whispered. Her eyes were filled with fear as I lingered near the trash can. I hadn't spoken about the creature to her yet, and I could tell that she wasn't likely to tell me much, but still I felt the need to get answers. There's something living in the woods. I've seen it. I said, as I placed the plate back down. Her eyes twitched, and she looked away. I must prepare for Jonah to return home. Much work to be done, she answered, as she flitted away to another room. Outside, I saw the snow was falling more rapidly now, covering up the roads. But I could see strange footprints out there, moving about the farmland. Evidence of creatures that seemed to be using this area to their heart's content unhindered by any person. I saw one of them enter the kitchen soon after this thought crossed my mind. It moved like lightning to the leftovers the farm wife had given out. It chomped and it licked at the pan, its wild eyes glaring up at me, daring me to stop them. I could see from their snarled and broken teeth that the creature was ravenous for food. It looked like it wanted to rip me limb from limb. I reached for a knife to defend myself, only for the wife to grab my wrist and pull me back to the hallway. We mustn't disturb them, she whispered, repeating the instructions as I saw something long and skinny crawl from one of the cabinets. This one looked even more malnourished than the others, its lanky form hardly able to pull its body across the floor. The other creature began to snarl, protecting the leftovers as best as it could, and I watched in disbelief as the two monsters fought, biting and snapping at one another, ripping the flesh off their scrawny bodies. Perhaps what was most frightening about them was... How much like children they looked. Starved, naked children that had turned animalistic. The woman kept me still until they had left into the cold, and I I dropped the knife, my heart beating wildly. What the hell are those things? I shouted at her, but she was too petrified in fear to say a word, and insisted we wait for her husband to return. When Jonah made it back to the house that night, the dark clouds covered the sky, but the ground was illuminated by the snowfall. We heard the other trolls moving about the land, attacking animals and neighbors, just the same until he made it in the house. As we ate just a little bit of porridge and yogurt, the rest of their food pantry was barren and dry, I felt the need to break the ice in the conversation. How long have you been dealing with these demons? I asked. My stomach was growling for the lack of food, and I knew why. This entire town was living in fear of these creatures, letting them run amok. The husband drew in his breath and put his bowl on the ground just as I had finished talking. We heard loud roars against the door, slamming and opening them over and over again, making everyone on edge as I saw several of the trolls crawl into the kitchen and steal what little food we had left. As the demons took our dinner away, the husband explained the situation as best he could. They come when the snow hits the ground. There are at least a dozen of them. Some speculate perhaps there are more out there in the woods, but they take what they want, and in exchange, they let us live. He whispered solemnly, even as one of the ghastly creatures licked pudding and yogurt right off of his beard. He did his best not to flinch. We protect our young ones by abiding by their rules, 
keep others from being attacked or punished by their cruelty, he added, as the banging came to a stop and the creatures fled out the door again. But your children starve. Your town does. I can tell just from your wife and your children that they need, they need to have food or they won't make it through the winter, I argued. He pursed his lips, obviously not wanting to reveal another nasty detail of the story, but I wasn't having it. This madness had to stop. Who's in charge of this village? We should round up all the men, find these things, and, and kill them, I told them both. And risk their wrath. Possibly kill even more innocent lives? You're an outsider. You don't want to attempt to dictate how we live. Jonah snapped back as he slammed his fist on the table. <clears throat> the whole kitchen got quiet as he cleared his throat and added, Snow's become heavy this year, and therefore our sacrifices will be greater. The elder of our village has chosen to throw a festival to the spirits of the earth, which watch over us tomorrow. And once we finish this ritual, the demons will leave us alone. I saw the wife's face get pale as something unspoken was left out of the conversation, but I decided not to press the matter any further. I was sure the rest of the small village would likely follow the same strange rituals as these folks. And I was considering simply leaving. That opportunity never came, though. During the night, the little creatures came back. This time more numerous than ever, clattering against doors, snarling against the windows. The children cried themselves to sleep, and I hardly could close my eyes for fear of them simply entering the house and doing whatever they pleased with me. I kept the knife that I had hidden away under my pillow that night, as the monsters roamed freely, determined to escape this nightmare the next day. But I was so exhausted from the ordeal, I... I don't recall much about the morning except Jonah rising and telling the children to dress as though they were attending a Sunday sermon. You'll be joining us as well. It will be safer than remaining here, the wife explained. I saw genuine concern for my well-being in her eyes, so I decided to not question. I was actually a bit curious to see what sort of ritual the town folk might perform that would appease these creatures, so I followed them down the snow-covered roads towards the main marketplace. The rest of St. Lepaldi was just as quaint and simple as I expected, a testimonial to their refusal to connect to the modern world. I wondered as we got closer to the town square if this was because of the creatures or something. I saw villagers in their homes and businesses peeking out, all dressed in either their Sunday best or some kind of colorful costume that reminded me of Santa's elves. As we approached the center of town, I soon realized why they all seemed to be shaking in their boots. There was a massive stone statue there of a giantess, carved in the finest rock this side of the main coast, and surrounding her I saw artistic representations of the twelve demonic children that I had seen over the course of the last few nights. The entire square had been shoveled free of snow to all for a platform to be built around the statue, along with long, tall torches and metallic iron cages that lined the corners of the square. In three of those cages I saw people, naked and shaking from the cold of the elements, screaming to be let loose even as their leaders of this small villa calmed the crowd. Brother Jonah, have you brought our final sacrifice, the fruit of the country? One man asked. I have, Lord. He stands before you now, Jonah responded. Then I suddenly realized my role in this festival. I was not invited as a guest. These people were about to sacrifice me to this massive stone edifice. As soon as the realization hit me, I tried to run, but Jonah pushed me down to the gravel and shoved his boot on my chest. It's better if you don't fight it, stranger. Your presence here was a blessing from our giants to prevent my family from losing anyone. The Lord of the Snow gave us you, he explained. Several burly men tied me with ropes and placed me in a cage to the right as the elders continued to make a speech, passing out bowls and other utensils to the crowd. Brothers and sisters, our harvest has drawn to a close. The shadow of snowfall is overcast and the spirits of the earth must be appeased. 
Let us pray now to them that our township remain under their watchful eyes. Let us ask them for forgiveness for walking on their lands. The entire crowd began to chant and moan and bow before the statues as several men lit the cages on fire. Starting to my left, I desperately looked towards the husband and wife for some kind of help, knowing I would soon be engulfed if they didn't act. Great Gryla, Lady of the Hills and Devourer of Flesh, wife to our sleeping saint and mother to the thirteen demons, come forth and feast upon these sinful children of men. Let their flesh atone for our year of waste. Our forgiveness be upon their deaths. I heard something shake and rumble, and I saw that the stone statue seemed to be moving on its own, suddenly taking life as the entire town shrieked and trembled. The giantess grumbled and reached down, crushing the first cage with her strong hand as she snarled loudly. Her children came to life next, snickering and snarling into the crowd as they attacked random townspeople. Their elder chanted that they would be allowed to feast on any they pleased. I knew I would be the next meal for this cult of mad followers, and I begged the family that they let me stay with them for help. But they were so aghast at the ceremony, they paid me no heed. I crouched down as the giantess crushed the top of the cage, giving me mere seconds to run. I, I leapt from the trap and raced across the snow, the older men of the town shouting to hunt me down. I didn't stop for anything. I bolted from the town towards the woods, hiding in the tall grass as the demonic children continued to attack all the villagers that they had pleased. I couldn't stop to reflect on the hellish nightmare as I gathered my strength, and I kept running. I kept running into the night until my power failed me. And when I awoke, I was on the road again, covered in blood and mud and snow. And a passing car asked if I needed aid. I saw I had made it all the way back to the crossroads, and I thanked them for the help, barely able to crawl into the back seat. As I got my rest, I asked them where they were headed, hardly even considering their response important at first. The driver checked his GPS, the instruments glitching, as he admitted, uh, Well, I'm, I'm a bit lost. I just considered going towards that township for some help. I grabbed the back of the car seat, my wide and frantic eyes pleading that he didn't. You mustn't go there. All right, just keep driving. Even, even if it's all night, you stay away from that dreadful town. As he turned around the vehicle to go the other way, I heard the howl of a cat off in the woods. And I shivered in panic. Snow was coming down harder than ever as we left. Now I only hope that we made it far away from this madness. Before another nightmare took shape. Living Below Zero is not meant to be fun. It's, it's definitely not for everyone. And I certainly wouldn't be here if it wasn't for a rather nasty divorce a couple years back. The average temperature here is negative 20 Fahrenheit with an added 10 degrees in wind chill or more if Mother Nature is feeling especially feisty, and that's, that's, that's on a good day. <laughs> Thankfully, I had the skills to get a fairly decent job for this area, that of a forest ranger. You know, that the position is a bit different from the usual kind in places, since we're so remote. Most of the time, I'm traveling across a snowy wilderness, stocking up public cabins with supplies. These cabins usually have what, what some call backcountry accommodations, and by that I mean uh, we, we supply the bare minimum, and the rest is up to you. This includes food, water, bedding. You know, so don't don't expect getting a five-star Hilton unless the last camper that stopped by was kind enough to leave you something. Accessing them isn't easy, because you know, these aren't really meant for your ordinary traveler. To even make it up here, you need to be prepared. Can't even tell you how often I find frozen corpses of hunters just a few miles from the cabins. Killed over simply because they didn't plan ahead. One of the biggest things that I have to contend with, besides weather and wild animals, you know, the, these creatures are smart and like to break into places to steal anything they can get their grubby little paws on. Which is why we stress that campers and such shouldn't leave anything behind. 
it isn't simply to make this whole enterprise unpleasant for you. It's to keep the site safe. I got a call from my operations manager about just a situation where, where a report came in from one of the troopers about a cabin that looked broken into by a bear or something. Officer was already on the trail of the offender, and I was tasked with heading out to make sure the cabin itself was still up to snuff. Travel ordinarily is a three-part process. First, I have to wait for one of the bush pilots to take me to the closest drop point, just to avoid an extra 30-mile trek through the rugged terrain. The flight's crazy, with fog and winds that take about an hour to reach the nearest fuel site, and it's still another 15 miles from the cabin that was reported. From there, I wait for a sledder trying to stay warm by standing as close to the pumps as possible while the plane fills the tank. I know that their job is likely ten times harder than mine having to go deliver goods to people that live in even further remote areas. For some, this place is a paradise. In others, it's hell. I'm sure you can guess where my opinions lie. When this letter arrives, he tells me that he can take me to a two-mile marker that's meant to be a game trail for the cabin. Doesn't look like it's been used in a while, but I, th I thank him, pay him for his services. I know that because of the way this business works, I'll have to wait until tomorrow before seeing another sledder to head back. At this point, as I move forward, I'm completely alone. Or so I think. There's some comfort with loneliness, I'll admit. The wind is all you hear as you trek across the wide open Alaskan wilderness. There isn't a soul in sight. It's soothing to realize that nothing can hurt you. I have to be on guard constantly, aware of my surroundings at all times. Every branch that's broken or a scratch against the trunk of a tree is telling me a story about what happened here. Something that could change the scenic landscape into a hellscape. But there aren't any telltale signs to make out as I approach the cabin. In fact, it would seem that this one's completely abandoned. Not even a hint of a break-in, like the report claimed. Didn't make sense. I can't be sure until I got inside, though, so I, I head towards the main entrance. I wiggle the door handle. It opens with ease, revealing a very simple, rustic interior. There isn't so much as a footprint on the ground or even a tuft of hair to show that an animal's been through here. The cabin appears untouched, but I know that can't be right. Because I notice a hunting rifle wedged behind the door and a canteen of drinking water. So someone's definitely been here, I realize, as I put my own gear down and decide to take a look around. First thing I do for any cabin is to make sure that you have plenty of firewood, so I made my way towards the tool shed, a few meters from the main property, and along the way, I did my best to search for any sign that there was another person nearby. The wind was much quieter now, giving me a chance to listen and meditate on what to do next. I hated the fact that I might come here for nothing, but maybe whoever was supposedly broken in was long gone. It just didn't seem like... There would be much for me to do except sleep and head home, I realized. Not necessarily a bad ending for the trip, I told myself. I opened the shed and found the axe missing. Now my guess about another person being here once again, raising red flags, and I immediately felt the need to watch the landscape. It was so silent I could only hear my own tromping through the snow as I returned to the main cabin. I told myself to be calm and to think. Was someone in the tree line watching and waiting? I wondered as I stepped back into the cabin. It was a bit more hurried this time, feeling as though my mind was playing tricks with me as I returned. To my utter disbelief, there were more furnishings now. A rug? Some coolers? A mattress? I had only been outside for less than ten minutes. I hadn't seen anyone approach the cabin, I thought, as I, as I got my own pistol off my hip and checked the rest of the tiny property. There wasn't another entrance into this place. So how would they manage to sneak past me when I went to the tool shed? I peered towards the tree line. The whole area looked deserted, but these new items in the cabin did not make me feel at ease any longer. I was being watched. I was sure of it. I knew I would need to keep vigilant the rest of the evening. No sleep for me. That wasn't going to be easy, though, as I knew I would need to journey out again for fresh food and water, or else I wouldn't be able to make it through the night. Could potentially starve myself, but I knew that 
That would make me more vulnerable to whatever was out there roaming the wilderness. I decided as I left out the front door to prop up a trap of sorts to see if, if I'd be able to catch the perpetrator in the act of entering and leaving. A simple tripwire with a bell attached to it would do the trick for any animal, but I think this was likely a skilled hunter, so... So we had to think outside the box. Have the wiring set up inside where it was difficult to see. It'd probably only work once, but... It would get the job done, I thought. I looked towards the snowy fields that surrounded me and I felt uneasy. The entire territory was deathly still now. Not even a sign of deer on the trail or birds in the sky. Like everything had come to a stop. Grabbing the hunting rifle, I decided to make a quick run to the nearby forest for dinner and then get back as fast as I could. The longer I stayed, the more exposed I was. I only went maybe a mile from the cabin, using the deep woods to the east as cover to watch a grove of trees and pick off a few squirrels. It wasn't much, but in this wasteland, I knew not to be picky. As I shot my third, I heard the bell ring from the cabin, and I didn't even get a chance to grab my kill. Instead, I was running. I was leaping through the snow to find out who or what was there waiting. The door was wide open, and I saw boots to the side of the bed, immediately feeling on edge as I shouted at the door, This is Ranger Tom Frayer. Come out of there peacefully, and there won't be a problem. I urged. I could see wet footprints of someone that had entered. There was no response, and I cautiously peered through the empty entry. I ventured inside, shocked and confused, to see the cabin mysteriously empty, except it now had even more furnishings. Canned food, flowered plants, hunting trophies on the wall. I felt like this was the sort of thing that would take months to do, and yet... Yet whoever was stalking me had done so in mere minutes. I shouted again that they should show themselves, but, but I didn't get a response. Was I, was I losing my mind? The night was falling fast, but I was too alert and paranoid to sleep. I sat on the bed and I watched the door, listening and waiting for something strange to happen. But now I was convinced that someone was toying with me, and I was sure that they would be seeking shelter soon enough. Temperature gauge I brought with me read negative 10, and I knew that didn't account for the whipping winds. But the darkness didn't provide me with any answers, only more questions for the strange events that were happening. I did my best to stay awake for as long as I could, gun pointed near the door, to wait for the intruder. I kept telling myself that it could be a misunderstanding. Maybe the trooper had seen a smaller animal mess with the cabin, and now... A Regular bystander was roaming the countryside and stumbled across the cabin, but but they refused to enter. An oddity I was having difficulty accepting, given how cold it was. I mean, no sane person would face the cold on a night like this, but, but of course there was no guarantee that the person that stalked me was actually in their right mind, I thought. Then I heard what sounded like scratching on the outer walls. Then it, then it sounded like tapping. A repeated, almost patternistic method to their madness. Wait. Morse code. I froze and kept the weapon aimed. These places don't allow for anything to lock the doors in the event that someone needs them for an emergency, and honestly, I simply wanted this confrontation to be over rather than deal with this taunting any longer. Come on out, then! I insisted. It was then that I sat there and I heard the strange noises. I realized it, it wasn't simply an attempt for me to be drawn outside. It was communication. I listened and I searched through the cabinet so I could find something to scribble on. A simple pencil and paper would have to do the trick. L. E. A. V. E. Leave. As soon as I finished writing it, I felt a cold sweat drip down the back of my neck. The wood-burning stove was going, and I didn't even remember placing any firewood in it. The intruder was giving me a warning, and this was my chance to listen, I realized. But I had nowhere to go, nor was I sure that this wasn't a trap. The nights here are far worse than anything you might endure in the day, and even with the best of gear... Traversing the snow in the middle of the dark was a bad idea. Not just because of the animals, but because because of how easily you can get lost. The rapping against the outside of the cabin became more incessant. 
and I wondered if there was any chance that survival to escape would be even possible. I pushed open the front door and shot it towards the empty horizon. I'm not leaving until you show yourself. In response, I heard the sound of a shotgun and I dropped to the ground. I couldn't tell you for sure where the hunter was firing, but it sounded like I was right in their line of target practice. Instantly, I slammed the cabin door shut and clutched my own weapon to my body. The shots hit the side of the cabin repeatedly. The mysterious hunter trying to scare me into the open. No, I wanted to get out of here. Okay, but... Now I wasn't sure outside was any safer than inside. And then things were just beginning to get weird within my confined space. Already it felt like my mind was playing tricks on me about the interior of the cabin. I went to the small kitchen that was sealed off from the rest of the area, assuming that it would act as the extra shield for the attacker to break through and buy me a little bit more time. Instead, as I opened the door, I found that it led nowhere. I stared at the blank wall, confusion rippling across my body as even more shots rang out. The door flung open and I heard this strange howling. Something was inside the room with me, but I, I couldn't see it. It pushed against me the way a strong wind would, and it made me fall to the floor and drop my weapon. And then I saw the supernatural phenomenon begin to occur. And had I not experienced it with my own two eyes, I would call myself a liar, but I knew that no force on earth could cause the items in that cabinet to begin to... levitate. It was as if some great invisible force was tossing items at me, screaming at me to leave. Was it just an animalistic growl, or was there someone else there? Someone from beyond the grave haunting this wilderness? I heard scratching against the windows, and the cabin began to rattle, almost like a quake was hitting it. A virtual impossibility in this region, I realized, as I stayed completely still and watched the cabin begin to sink toward the snow. The floor was disappearing, and my invisible attacker was trying to escape. The windows shattered, and the logs began to split in two. The ground was opening. Bits of wood and destroyed chunks of floorboard were being sucked into a strange, abysmal whirlpool that was forming a gap between me and the front door. I, I thought as I saw footprints run off into the snow, the the stalker escaping ahead of me. I pushed my back against the wall, trying to desperately call for aid on my radio. It felt like a, like a bad fever dream, a dangerous hallucination that would take my life. I wasn't even sure if anyone would hear me, but I, I had to try. Mayday, Mayday, Ranger Freyer here. I'm over in cabin 305 requesting assistance. I shouted into the device as the sinkhole made a roaring noise. I was peering into a black hole that seemed to be growing deeper and deeper with each passing minute, and then... Then something unimaginable appeared beneath the darkness. It was rows of teeth. Teeth as sharp as sharks that could be seen near the bottom of the pit, rotating and snarling. His eye gauged how far a jump to the entrance would be, and the items that had mysteriously been inside the cabin now were cascading downward, swallowed up by this cosmic monster. I tried one last time to get a response to cry for help, but, but the radio only gave back static as I prepped the jump. And then I saw a shadow cross the front door of the cabin. The intruder had returned. I steeled myself and I leapt across the hole, using all of my strength to make the jump. It felt like the shadow was yanking me to safety, something unseen, making sure I didn't die. And I was just barely making it. Even with his unseen help, I crawled over the edge of the pit and I caught my breath, the radio coming to life with a response. I clutched it and tried to hear what my rescuers had said. But it sounded like my own voice echoing back. Hey day, hey day, this is... Ranger Freyer, the voice said as I moved out of the front door. The night had shifted to day, the entire Alaskan wilderness no longer looking like the icy land space that I was familiar with, and suddenly I was in a wasteland. A place beyond what this world could comprehend, a mixture of colors and shapes that were swirling in and out of reality as I stumbled to keep upright. It reminded me of a time in college when I had and actually taken psychedelic mushrooms for a trip, and I... I regretted it. Everything looked like a parallel world, foreign and strange. The trees were either upside down or hanging in the air rather than rooted to the ground. The sky was splitting open and the stars were moving to and fro across the sky. There were creatures with thousands of eyes in the heavens, reaching down to consume the sinking cabin. 
a massive pillar of fire rising into the air as the final bite of the rural building were crushed by the darkness. The radio screamed louder, my voice again. Leave now, it urged. I dropped it in the snow and started to run. It felt like the landscape was stretching on forever. The clouds wouldn't move from the sky, and nor would the sun. Was this some sort of strange phenomena that would, would cause this cabin to be trapped in a cosmic glitch? It felt like it was a dream, and yet, as I kept trying to move, my body grew heavy, and I collapsed to the bottom of a hill, slamming my nose against a rock, making it bleed. I knew I was still in a reality, just not the one that I could make sense of. The ground still shook and split apart. Every step I made seemed to keep me going towards the cabin as it was descending into the snow. It was nearly gone. As I crawled away from the cabin again, I saw a shimmering figure trying to do the same. It reminded me of my younger self hunting the Alaskan wilderness trying to survive. Its eyes burned like fire, and it was chasing itself across the horizon. Over and over again, despairing to find a way out, it was hunting me, firing at me, and urging me to keep going. Then it dropped the hunting knife in front of me in the snow and it tried to attack me. I hoped to find it as a guardian angel was shattered. I found myself hardly able to breathe as we stumbled across the sheet of ice, the thin, cold material cracking from our combined body weight. It was shimmering in and out, moving rapidly in different dimensions as it, as it tried to choke me. Should have left, the voice boomed. My voice, the voice of a man that had lost everything. I grabbed the knife and I fought back. It was fight or die, and the, the instinct to survive took over me as I stabbed the strange, shimmering creature. I told myself this couldn't be the same man that I was. This was a, a darker self, a, a different shattered dimension that had been trapped here for ages. It seemed to shimmer in and out of the atmosphere around it, until at last it appeared to be wearing my face. An older, gray-haired, and hungry, starved version of myself. Maybe the same one that had been stuck here. Was that what explained all the strange things here? How long, I wondered, had my other self been stranded in this loneliness? I saw the ice begin to break and I rushed back to the snow as the other me fell into the water, shrieking aloud as his body was completely destroyed by the deadly bleak waters. It only took a second and I knew he was gone. And then I made my way towards the game trail. I was bleeding, I was bruised, hardly able to move. It was hard to stay awake as the overwhelming pain and stress of the event hit me like a ton of bricks. And instead I fell unconscious. The shimmering landscape, my last memory, as is... darkness took over. About an hour later they found me, offering fresh water and binding me onto their sled to get back home. I felt delirious, shaking like a leaf as they assisted. I tried to warn them of the dangers of this place, but couldn't even make the words come out. Stay down, mate. You're wounded pretty bad. Something attacked you, the hunter explained. That was barely coherent, still trying to come to terms with everything I had seen, but... I finally told him I needed to get to the operations facility. He got me to the nearest airport where I found cover and waited for a plane. I noticed the sun seemed to be especially bright for such a cold day, but he looked at me confused. It's just now November. When did you think it was? He whispered. It occurred to me I'd been stuck in the cabin for months, without even realizing time had passed. Further proof my ordeal was real, the temporal paradox nearly driving me insane. And maybe it did in some fashion. Some version of me was there, so desperate to escape, he considered killing me the only solution. Maybe by killing it, I freed him. I didn't know what to make of all of it. But I made the request to operations that we should shut the cabin down. I blame the bears. They didn't question it. It's common enough for the animals to ransack the place, even the ones that had properly set up traps. So to soothe my own weary mind, I told myself it was bears. I convinced myself that what I experienced couldn't have been real. Some deep inner soul that still keeps me restless tells me... I know it wasn't. And some part of me wonders if maybe I'm still trapped in all this. 
is an illusion. I'm still at that cabin. I'm still waiting and sitting, staring at the door, pointing the rifle. Thinking that I just have to wait a few moments longer for rescue. But rescue will never come. Maybe it never did. Or maybe... Maybe it did, and I'm... I'm too far gone. My favorite story as a child was called The Hideous Hair. Of course, it went by other names depending on who was telling it, uh, and what kind of mood they were in. My father never liked that name. When we were snuggled in bed, he sat by our nightstand with his fingers running over the grooves on the dollar store lamp. He called it the hag in the hair. If he felt especially adventurous, he'd replace hag with a word we weren't allowed to say. There's the scrawny little ten-somethings that we were. The story in question was a well-loved one, passed down from our thrice great-grandmother to her son, and from there to her daughter and so on. All the way to our father. The lesson was simple enough to grasp, but it wasn't one learned by the glass slipper fitting on the princess's foot, or the frog shedding his slimy skin for that of a prince. Once upon a time, my father would say in a hushed tone as if he was telling us a secret tale that was only for Jacob's and my little ears. There was an old hag who lived in a tiny house in the middle of nowhere. The hag in question did live in the middle of nowhere, and behind her house was a vegetable garden. Rabbits would come and steal bites from her carrots and lettuce. She didn't like it, not one bit. She hated rabbits. So when fall raked the last of the trees bare, and the winter's cold fingers crept up ever so slowly, she sat in a rocking chair, reading how to get rid of the little bastards. And that's when she heard the very first knock. It wasn't an ordinary knock, mind you. It was a thump knock. She knew it must have been an animal at her door. When she moved to the door and threw it open, there stood a hare. It was white as the driven snow, but was by no means perfect. It bore mangled ears and an empty, bloodied socket where an eye used to be. The poor creature had seen some hardship, that was for sure, but of course, the old woman had no sympathy. Miss, if you might spare some warmth for the night, I would be forever in your debt. My warren has flooded with the autumn rain. My father would always pitch his voice up an octave and soften his eyes when voicing the rabbit. The hag's voice was always low, snapping tone, like dry twigs in a fire. For a moment, the hag laughed. It was the laugh of a mean old bitch, the kind that made you think of ruby slippers and gingerbread houses. You think I'm going to let a silly old rabbit stay the night in my house? That's a gag, a gag indeed. You better get off my porch or I'll get my gun and spatter your freaky little face all over it. The hare, terrified for its little life, bounded away into the thicket. The next evening was colder still. The thump knocking came again as the hag was embroidering a small fox into the middle of a flower ring. She loved foxes. Foxes eat rabbits. Of course, they also eat chickens. All of hers had disappeared several winters ago under mysterious circumstances. She stood and threw open the door yet again. She met the chilling air with disgust, just as she did the rabbit's renewed pleading. Miss, surely you can spare me a night's shelter. My body's so weak. I don't think I can stand another night in the cold. In this cold, hungry forest. I'll repay you however I'm able. There was no laugh from her lips this time. She only stared down at the bastard bunny. You'd do better in the forest than you will if you keep tottering around my doorstep. Get gone, you hideous hare. With that, she made for the broom closet before it could feel the bite of straw and scampered away into the thicket once more. The next evening, the first snow of winter had just begun to grace the ground. The hag sat by a roaring fire with a pot of tea and a small platter of cheese and bread. When the thump knocking came from the third and final time, she stormed over to the door and wrenched it open. She could barely contain her fury as the rabbit pleaded. Please, miss, the snow has come and I'll freeze to the very death. One night out of the cold is all I ask, no more. 
She stomped her foot, barely missing its paw. At this point in the story, my dad would jump to his feet and stomp his foot onto the ground, spooking us without fail. Then freeze! If I see you on my doorstep again, I'll skin you good, you wretched little thing. With that, she slammed the door, nearly crushing the poor hair in the process. The rabbit began to squeak with desperation. She snatched the cheese knife from the small end table and made for the door. The hare opened its mouth to speak, but the hag gave it no time. She angrily stepped out to snatch it up and skin it into a nice fur hat, but she missed. It gaily ran inside, slamming the door behind her. Let me in! Let me in! She cried as she heard the lock click into place. You'd better get off my porch or I'll skin you to a bloody pulp! The rabbit sneered. After banging for several minutes and a string of curses that would make the devil blush, she realized she was not getting back in and walked uncertainly into the night to beg for shelter, just as the hare had done. Sitting on the old oak steps of the front porch, I remember wondering if my dad would tell us that story that evening. He wasn't up for telling stories much nowadays. Now all we heard was his soft grieving from down the hall, that and the fire and brimstone, and the word of God from our aunt. There were many things our father wasn't up for anymore. Holding a job, feeding us, clothing us, caring for us when we were sick. That duty fell on my aunt, at her insistence. I read the passage over and over, absorbing almost none of it. My thoughts, scattered as they were, were interrupted by the crows of my aunt's rooster. I closed the Bible, placing it to the side, and watched the snow gently fall. Snow was an odd sight in November around these parts, but the weatherman on the old fuzzy TV had said a cold front was coming from the northwest. The corn stalks swayed in the gentle breeze, and amidst it all sat the scarecrow. It was no ordinary scarecrow. It didn't know who made it, but it bore the face of a malnourished rabbit, a ridge above where each eye would have been cast deep shadows on its face, and its burlap skin was pulled tight, giving it a gaunt face to match its tattered ears. The body was painfully low effort compared to the face, consisting of only two tree branches and a burlap bag stuffed with hay, all tied to a post. As the snow continued to fall, it dusted its limbs gently and white. My childish brain was stuck with the notion that the scarecrow might be cold. I stood then, walking back into the house. My steps were light as I crept to the front closet. In the time I'd been living in that old farmhouse, I knew that the less noise I made, the less my existence mattered. Generally, one would view that as a negative thing, but to me, it meant avoiding confrontation. I wasn't so lucky that night, though. It couldn't always be avoided. Just what the hell do you think you're doing? My aunt snapped as I reached for the spare winter coat in the closet. The smell of sap clung to her skin and stained her fingers like blood. I considered myself lucky she did not still hold the axe. I was so caught off guard that I gave her my honest answer. I'm getting a coat for the scarecrow. It's cold. She let out a mirthless laugh. It was her way of saying, no the hell you aren't, without wasting her words. She slammed the closet door shut, nearly catching my fingers. I jumped. Where's the Bible I gave you? I realized a moment before the back of her firm, bony hand hit the back of my head that it was still sitting outside on the porch. Go get that damn Bible! You should be ashamed, leaving the good book out in the elements like that? Rotten. So like the rotten child I was, I immediately ran back outside to retrieve the Bible. The snow was falling thicker now. The graceful flakes mashed into blustery gray. The air tasted like dirty ice and pine. I pulled my jacket tighter around me as I clutched the Bible. The scarecrow was still sitting at its diligent watch. For a moment, I imagined it shivering in the cold. And that's when I made up my mind. The yellow grass crackled under my feet. It was the kind that stayed perpetually crunchy, even in the lushest of springs. Hello, 
I said meekly as I came to stop right in front of it. I thought you might like a little company. The hair crow gave no reply. I found myself relieved that it had not spoken back, as if that was a reasonable thing to fear in the first place. You look lonely and cold. So I I came to give you this. I shrugged the jacket from my shoulders and stood on my tiptoes to affix it to his branchy ones. The breeze that swayed the cornstalk slowly died. The quiet was serene until it went on for too long. I felt the cold fingers of observance creep up my back. Something was watching me. How can you watch the fields if you don't have any eyes? I asked, mostly to break the silence. Here, let me fix that for you. Everyone deserves to see, especially you. You have such a nice view of the sunset. I took out the permanent marker I left in my overall pocket from when Aunt Rachel had made me copy Bible verses earlier after I couldn't find her misplaced axe. I was nearly unable to reach, but I managed to give it the best rabbit-looking eyes I could. We stood there for a moment, observing each other. Finally, I turned back. I'll see you again soon. I tossed over my shoulder as I began to brisk walk back to the warmth of the house. My aunt was mercifully drooling in her rocking chair, some late-night program droning on behind her snores. My father was awake in his room, even though I, I couldn't hear his voice. His grief was loud enough. I sat the Bible down on the china cabinet. My shoulders hadn't stopped shaking, and I blew into my red hands, trying to bring the feeling back to them. You really are one of a kind. The scent of cocoa rise from the pot that Jacob was stirring, warm and inviting. He was the one lucky enough to be able to use the stove out of the two of us. I watched you out of the window, you know. My shoulders relaxed. They'd been tense since meeting the scarecrow, for no particular reason. It had been only Jacob's eyes on me. I don't know why you get so close to that scarecrow, much less give it your jacket. That thing freaks me out, he confessed, as he poured the steaming chocolate into two silver mugs. I sighed. Nobody deserves to be alone, was all I could say. He rubbed his thumb over his bottom lip for a few moments, something he did when he was lost in thought. And then he smiled. Fair enough. But you better not go asking me for any of my clothes when yours are on that rabbit out there. You'll be running around yelling, my shoes, my shoes, the rabbit took my shoes. But you'll just have to be barefoot as that scarecrow tap dances all the way to New York City in your little Chuck Taylors. We both howled with laughter at this, until we nearly woke my aunt. Once we drained our mugs and our bodies had returned to its normal temperature, we moved up the creaking old stair to our bedroom. Worn white sheets swallowed us whole, and we both fell into a comfortable silence. There was no bedtime story from our father that night. Just as the first rays of sun were creeping over the windowsill and the rats in the walls were beginning to quiet, our Aunt Rachel woke us up for school with little more than a Breakfast is downstairs, don't be late. She was a brash woman. Someone called her behavior abusive, and they'd be right. But in those days, it was all filed under the all-too-broad label of strict. Still, she did the bare minimum of keeping us alive and healthy. As I walked out onto the porch, where the thin layers of snow from the night before had begun to melt... I saw my jacket. Jacob dragged behind me, and I wondered if it was him who'd retrieved the jacket and left it there on the porch so our aunt wouldn't turn my backside inside out. I just shrugged and I put it on. Jacob met me at the bottom step with our school bags, and off we went. It wasn't a long walk to and from school. The town had one bus and one route. It didn't end up in our neck of the woods for one reason or another. Though school was a safe haven, I hadn't made many friends there. Today would be the day that changed that. That day was the day where the teacher stood at the front of the class with a girl clutching the black strap of her Lisa Frank backpack and introduced Naomi to the class. When I met the girl who showed me her favorite books amongst the middle school library shelves, when I met the girl who held my hand in the hallway and gave me a quick, innocent kiss behind the tunnel in the rickety playground, 
That day changed my life forever. I skipped down the dirt road home. Jacob tried his best to keep up with me. The breath of honeysuckle flowers in the air felt sweeter that afternoon. What's got you about to fly away? Jeez, you're like a kite. For the first time since getting to school that morning, I felt a note of hesitation. I mean, sometimes I wondered what would have happened if I had kept a secret. So I hadn't found validation in Jacob. I scanned around and then whispered as if the very trees and dirt had eyes and ears. I kissed a girl today, Jake. This never feel about how it was wrong, like some part of me expected, and ooh rose from his mouth, the kind of jeering that fills classrooms when somebody gets called to the principal's office. Pandora has a crush on somebody? Is it the new girl? We spent the last leg of our journey home lightheartedly bickering back and forth, as siblings tend to do. It was only when the house came into view that Jacob grabbed my arm and stopped me. There was a deep sadness in his voice. Pandora, listen to me. This is important. Whatever you do, you cannot tell Aunt Rachel about this. Okay, she... She won't like it. <laughs> I want you to keep it a secret between us for now, okay? At that time, it didn't click in my mind why he'd said that. The bruises of Jacob's arms and legs, the cries of unclean for my aunt, and the sad look he often had in his eyes in that year that we lived with her never truly hit me until the day it did. We got inside and were immediately put to work on the back garden. The afternoon moved slower than a slug in molasses until Aunt Rachel sent us to bed after a meal of watery chicken stew and two hot baths. My muscles ached as I pulled open our window. I paused, listening for Jacob's slow and even breathing. And when he didn't stir, I climbed out onto the front porch roof. I slid down the wooden support and turned my eyes out to the field. There sat the scarecrow. The half moon hung low in the sky above it, a yellow and slightly sour lemon wedge. I walked up to him as if approaching an old friend. Um, Mr. Harecrow? No, that's not right. You need a name. Everybody needs a name. How about... Frith? The name had worked its way out of the corners of my mind. From when I lifted Watership down from the high school-only section of the library... It fit in a way that I knew nothing else would. The wind made the cornstalks sway. Almost in approval. I smiled. I love names. Especially Naomi. I love the name Naomi. I imagine the scarecrow was giving me a knowing look. Okay, I know. I know. I'll tell you what happened. So just like with my brother, I relayed my secret in a quiet tone, as if I was telling it the directions to some treasure deep in a swamp. Frith, for his part, listened patiently and quietly. I talked with him until the first hints of the sun lightened the sky. Once I realized that dawn was fast approaching, I scrambled back into the roof and into my bed. I thought you'd gone and gotten yourself killed. I heard him before I saw him. Jacob was sitting up with his eyes weak from sleep. Then I went and looked out of the window. Why do you like that scarecrow so much? It gives me the creeps. I sighed. And I began to change out of my pajamas and into school clothes. I hadn't shut my eyes the entire night. School would be exhausting today, even if it was better than here. He looks lonely. Nobody deserves to be alone. And I know I'm the only one who's brave enough to go spend time with him. I paused to pull on my shoes before adding, No offense, Jacob. He pulled himself out of bed. The cycle of school, chores, homework, bed started all over again. Whatever free time I had was spent with my brother, my nose and whatever books I could hide from my aunt, or, or talking with my quiet friend Frith. Days turned into weeks, weeks into months, and months turned into nearly a year. My aunt only got worse in her treatment of us. The night that we were sent to bed without supper and the pages of Bible verses we had written gradually grew in number. We saw very little of our father during that time. Only the ghosts of his footprints 
moving to and from the kitchen or bathroom at odd hours of the night, and the whispers of weeping for our mother and his wife. I never blamed him for turning a blind eye to our abuse. And I still don't. He was at the bottom of an inescapable ocean. That's why when he walked in on the night of Halloween, after we'd been sent to bed without supper yet again, Jacob and I were shocked to see him appear in our doorway. He looked fragile, in the purest sense of the word. His perpetual sore eyes crisscrossed with red veins. He'd eaten very little food in the months since we'd gotten here, and his figure reflected that. He was more rake than man. He ran a hand through his matted orange hair and sucked in a breath through chapped lips. I held in my tears at the sight of him. You kiddos have time for a bedtime story? I saw the renewed joy in his eyes when our faces lit up. I think we can fit you into our schedule, Jacob said in a breathless, happy voice. He sat down on the end of my bed as Jacob flew across the room to us. Our father started a tale about a little girl living high in a tower, but I stopped him. Dad, you should tell us something scary. It's Halloween after all. He rubbed his scruffy chin as he considered my request. You two are awfully young for that sort of thing, aren't you? I laughed a little. Dad, I'm 13. For a moment, his eyes filled with sorrow. I knew now what that look meant. It was one of a man watching the lives of his kids slip by him, knowing that he wasn't present for it. Uh, Yeah, I, I guess you're right. After several long moments of deep thought, our father began to weave a tale about two little girls wandering in the forest on Halloween to find a magic well, only to find out it was haunted. It wasn't his best, but it kept us gripped until the very end. When the story concluded, he stood up and rubbed his face. I love you both so much. Don't ever forget that. He reached out a hand and offered us both a small brownie in the shape of a jack-o'-lantern. Our aunt didn't believe in Halloween, so there was no hoard of treats for us to be had. Jacob and I eagerly took the treats, and our dad smiled as we filled our stomachs with sweet chocolate goodness. He got to his feet and wiped at his perpetually weepy eyes. I'll be around more for you two now, I promise. I can't say for certain whether he would have kept that promise or not. I like to think that he would have. The weekend slipped by like a fish in oil. I stood in my locker after lunch Monday, searching for my math book. My face flushed when I felt two firm fingers press into my shoulder blade. You'll never guess what I saw, Naomi whispered, as if she'd seen in the King Tut's tomb. I stood turning towards her. Her eyes were soft but sly. She was hell on wheels, but... She made my heart sing. What? Don't leave me in suspense. She nodded towards the block of lockers where the obnoxious teen boys would often mill about and said, See that locker over there? There's something in it. A playboy. I was a sheltered child. She she said the word playboy with a drama that didn't land for me. What's that? She took my hand as we crept down the hall. It was beginning to empty out as stir-crazy kids piled into the worn jungle gyms and swings outside. It's a magazine with naked ladies. My jaw dropped. Seriously? I think I can get it for us, she said with a grin. The concept of something so scandalous, in private, in my young mind being proudly on display along with my still-emerging sexuality, made it an offer too tempting to pass up. We found the locker in question and she held a callous hand up to her ear as she worked the cheap blue lock. Naomi was an artist, and her medium was mischief. When the padlock popped open with ease, she handed it to me. You do the honors. No snooping. We just want a magazine. Naomi had a strange sense of morals about such things. Thievery was fair game, but only in moderation. Nothing more than we came for. She would have made a wonderful Robin Hood. 
I pulled open the locker, and my heart froze in my chest. It was empty. Save for a large white hair twitching on the metal floor, its head bent sideways, and dark, frothy blood dribbling out of its nose and mouth pooling onto the floor. Bile rose in my throat as a jarring noise grew around me from everywhere and nowhere. The dying squeals of a rabbit were something I should have considered myself lucky not to have heard before then. The cry felt like a child's. One that was screaming for their life. Before I knew what was happening, I felt the lockers on the opposite side of the hall against my back. I tumbled to the floor as a wave of nausea and dizziness washed over me. Pandora? Are you okay? Naomi helped me to my feet and steadied me. I pointed at the locker, blubbering something about rabbits. She looked... And then so did I. It was gone. I wondered if it was ever there in the first place. I rubbed my eyes as Naomi nabbed the dirty magazine. I haven't slept very well lately, I muttered. Bad dreams. She smiled and put a hand on my shoulder. That's what rabbits do, don't they? They disappear. I laughed. Then she laughed. Then we laughed so hard I forgot what we were laughing about. She pulled me into the bathroom, and we flipped through the pages of nude women in erotic poses as we huddled in the last stall on the right. When the bell rang, she pressed a soft kiss to my mouth and asked, Do you want to keep it? I stared at the outstretched magazine. The offer was tempting, yet so dangerous. Live a little, she joked in response to my hesitant expression. Open the box, Pandora. Okay. I finally relented. Wait one second. She took out her favorite purple sharpie, one she always kept on her. I watched her scribble at the very last page, right across the chest of a woman in a barely there bathing suit. It was an address and a phone number. As soon as I got home, I wrote it down in my journal. Had I not done that, Naomi likely would have been a middle school love, lost to the endless march of time and life. But that fate was instead replaced with a stream of letters that lasted well into my teens. Loving at first, but then only mutually friendly. I squirreled the Playboy away under my bed, tucking it so it lay parallel with the frame. There, I assumed it was safe. I dare not bring it out again unless I was sure I was alone in the deadest of autumn nights. Another week trickled by. The following Monday was calm until we returned home from school. On that day, Jacob had been stopped by our mastiff blue in the yard. So much of my mental energy spent on reflecting of what-ifs, wondering what would have happened had Jacob followed me like usual is one of the most prevalent. The wind whipped dry red leaves around the front yard as I stared out the window in the kitchen. My stomach growled and I moved to fix myself a sandwich wondering why my aunt had not yet accosted us for chores or homework. Behind me, I heard the quiet yet anxiety-inducing clacking of her shoes as she entered the room. I sat down the knife that I had been holding, and for far too long, it was absolutely silent. Then, under her breath, I heard the words, too many chances, and the devil in my house. I turned towards her and was knocked off balance by the backside of her hand, crashing into my face. Her voice was full of cold fury. Do you want to tell me what this thing is, you wretched little thing? I whimpered as she knocked me to the hard kitchen floor. I knew exactly what it was. It was the goddamn Playboy. I thought I'd hidden it well enough. I was wrong. Sinful little harpy, with your book full of whores. She snatched up my hair and started dragging me out through the doorway and towards the stairs, and I thrashed desperately. Disgusting little freak. I've tolerated this long enough. I've allowed Satan to take up residence in my house, and I will not have it any longer. Your sin will not go unpunished. Her voice popped and cracked with an unspeakable rage. Less curt than it had been before. My fingernails raked at the stairs, and anything else I might be able to gain purchase on as my head thumped against each solid wooden step. My nose hit the wall at one point and exploded with blood. I tasted dust and copper. By the time we were on the second floor, I was too dizzy to scream for help. 
She dragged me into the bathroom and slammed the door, locking it. You will both have to stand before the Lord and be judged. I will make sure of it. He'll throw your wretched, miserable souls into the great inferno. I wailed as she began to fill the tub with water. Urgent footsteps pounded against the kitchen downstairs, though I couldn't decipher their owner. Pulling myself up, I tried to throw myself towards the door. She caught me by the neck. Please, I begged. Please don't. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. She spat in my face. You're lucky. Maybe this water will purge you before you stand before God Almighty, she whispered as she plunged my head underneath the icy water. And my world went blurry. My body burst into uncontrollable shivers as I flailed desperately. I could feel my lungs filled with cold water and my aunt held her grip. But she slammed my face against the porcelain bottom of the bathtub. Crimson bloomed out into the water. For a moment, I thought of death. I wondered whether fire and brimstone truly would be waiting for me on the other side. Then I heard the screaming. The clatter of metal on metal, the breaking of glass, the barking of a dog. Behind all that, I could hear another sound in my delirious brain, one that I couldn't recognize. My aunt released me and stood up, storming out of the bathroom door with a slew of curses. I threw myself from the tub, throwing up mouthfuls of frigid water before gulping in as much air as I could. I struggled onto weak legs and ran for my life. I rammed my shoulder into the back door and tumbled ass over elbows down the back steps. I could hear the cacophony of noises that had freed me from my watery grave better now. Jacob had heard my desperate struggle. That was why he was running around the front yard, shouting blasphemies and obscenities and banging our only two pots together. My aunt was chasing him with a knife. Behind that, there was an ever-present cloud of cawing. The swarm of carrion birds blotted out the sun. I spilled out into the barn out back and slammed the big wooden door shut behind me, pushing some dust-coated farm equipment in front of the door. When the bang started at the door, I climbed into the loft and picked the corner with the least amount of spiderwebs. I shivered there for hours, blood drying on my face as my mind created shapes in the dark. I watched figures made out of shadow dig their claws into the sides of the loft and pull themselves up, ready to devour me. I could feel whispers of their fingers on my face. I didn't leave the barn until slivers of moonlight peeked into the rotting wood slats. My clothes were still damp as I trudged over to one of my only friends in this damn place. My breath came out in frigid clouds as I focused on drawing in air, in and out. She tried to drown me. She tried to kill me. I was going to die. I collapsed against Frith's sturdy wooden support. And I began to sob. I can't go back inside. She'll do it again. She'll do it again. I'm going to freeze out here. As I curled my knees into my chest and wailed in earnest, I felt something on my back. A thin scraping like the comforting touch of a mother, but in all the wrong ways. In my periphery I saw it, the end of a gnarled branch curled into knotted fingers. I couldn't move. The wind whistled around in the stalks of corn and it almost sounded like whispers. I launched up off the ground and ran around the back of the house. Jacob sat there beside the crawlspace door, where he'd no doubt been hiding. He looked up at me with a swollen black eye. Blood was caked onto his deep frown, and his nose bent just a little too far to the right. A long slash ran across his chin and jawline, a battle scar from saving my life. Guilt seized me for not coming to his aid at that moment, and I felt like a coward. She's gone insane. Dad isn't in his room. I think... She might have killed him. She hadn't murdered our father, of course. He'd gone into town that day to look for work. He wanted to turn our lives around. But his children suffering from the hands of an aunt with a murderous rage, there was little else that we can come up with. 
I didn't tell Jacob about the scarecrow, but it had touched my back with its crackly tree hands. Too much was going on. Though I knew he would believe me, there was only so much a mind like his could stand. We snuck back into the house, Jacob pulling me along and whispering reassurances as we climbed the stairs. Our feet as close to the wall as possible to avoid making the old wood creak. I could only breathe easy once we were in our room and the door was locked. It was a small barrier between us and the madwoman that now wanted our blood spilled. But it was a barrier nonetheless. We have to run away. Dad can't save us now. Jacob was shoving things into a bag. I was, I was still so tired. So very cold. I stripped out of my damp sweater, desperate for dry warmth. Morning. Can't we wait until the morning? I whispered. Jacob looked my way as I curled into the fetal position under my meager white blanket. His expression was heavy with a fight between fear and concern. Okay. Morning. But then we have to go. I rubbed my eyes hard. We'll sleep in shifts. He paused before nodding quietly. Jacob coaxed me out of bed and helped me into dry clothes, keeping his eyes on the door as often as he could. My brother. My protector. You'd better wake me up, I mumbled as my eyes grew too heavy to stay open. He didn't respond, instead merely throwing his blanket over me and causing a deep shiver to rack me. The kind you get when the warmth is finally returning to your body. I knew he would end up letting me sleep. My dreams were plagued with dark visions, twisting animalistic bodies, dipping in and out of the shadows as I could hear the cries for help from my brother somewhere in the distance, accompanied by wails of a discordant calliope. I shot upright in bed, sometimes in the early hours of the morning. Jacob lay against my bed. His breathing deepened in light sleep. Behind it, I could hear an odd sound. The creaking of the front door on its hinges, no doubt pushed by the wind. I slowly got to my feet and I slid them across the wooden floor to the door. Against my better judgment, I, I disengaged our bedroom lock and slowly pushed the door open. The house was icy and my shivers returned in full force. I coughed quietly into my hand as I came to the top of the stairs. As my bare feet descended the wood steps as quietly as possible, I found myself reciting a prayer that I'd heard whispered by my grandmother above my mother's pale body. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. I could hear the thumps in the living room. It sounded like movement of some sort of wild animal. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed the fruit of thy womb. The air smelled sour like rotting plants and urine. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now. Terror seized my lungs, making it hard to breathe as I neared the bottom. And at the hour of our death, I reached the bottom step and peeked into the living room. Holding my aunt above the floor as her pink slippered feet swung frantically was... Its long, knotted branches hovered just in front of her face, and my aunt's skin looked paper white in the glow of the TV. How the scarecrow kept upright in its single support post, I couldn't tell you. The physics bent to the will of whatever this thing truly was. The burlap was pulled tight around whatever lay beneath it, and yellow eyes with wide black pupils bulge out of the rips. Swaths of rough brown fabric hung from the mouth and cheeks, revealing a mouth filled to nearly bursting with white, dinosauric teeth. Before I could so much as blink, the scarecrow sunk its makeshift claws into her neck. A fountain of blood erupted from her mouth, and then everywhere else as it dragged its impossibly sharp digits through her neck like a sword through hot butter. Her headless body made a wet thump as it hit the ground. A soft whimper escaped her mouth, and the hare's head snapped to look at me. If she deserved it, make no mistake. But in the moment, I felt no sense of satisfaction. All I felt was insurmountable fear. 
I shrieked as I flew up the stairs. I could hear Jacob jump to his feet, and my body crashed into his as I flung myself into our room. Go! Now! We didn't have time to make it out the window. As the door opened, I flung Jacob towards my bed, and we scrambled underneath. We both heard the steady thumps as the monster I'd formerly known as Frith crept into our room. Pandora? Pandora, what is that? Jacob's voice was quiet and urgent, and I pressed his face into my chest. Nothing, Jacob. Just keep your eyes closed. Don't you look, okay? He protected me. No, I was doing the same. It stood over my bed, staring down into my eyes with its wide, soulless ones as I held Jacob close to me. That was all I knew until the sun began to creep over the cornfields. Its eyes and mine. I didn't know whether or not it intended for me to meet the same fate as my aunt. As dawn ran its fingers through the hills and forests of Tennessee... The scarecrow broke our staring contest. As soon as it began to move, I squeezed my eyes shut tight. It leaned down, and with a wooden claw, it stroked my right cheek. A thin trickle of blood ran its way down my cheek. But still, I remained frozen. It withdrew, and I heard the slow thumps as it retreated down the stairs and out the front door. I still have that scar. Despite the sun spilling into the room from the window, we didn't move from our spot under the bed. The terror and innocence both left my body in one great outpouring as the exhaustion of someone that witnessed a murder took hold. I pulled Jacob closer as my eyes slipped closed. The sound of a scream woke me up. It was the voice of a man, one I hadn't heard in so long. He was our father, our real father, not the ghost that had been long wandering the rough oaken floors of the farmhouse when we'd long since fallen into our beds. And before Jacob and I could fully get out from under the bed, he'd flown up the stairs and thrown open our door. His face was flushed, and his eyes were full of a vibrant sort of terror, the kind only a father who sees dark blood stains on the floor all the way to the back door and his sister and children nowhere to be found could feel. He was alive again. Grief. Stamped out like a dying fire pit by fresh fear. Kids, are you okay? I hated seeing him so worried. But running into his outstretched arms felt like... Like rising from the grave. Things moved extremely fast after that. Police were called. The farmhouse was coroned off with yellow tape that whipped in the late November wind. The cornfield where one scarecrow had gone AWOL was stripped bare. We found a temporary home in a shitty little inn in Main Street. The sanctioned search for my aunt didn't last long. On the third day, everyone went to sleep, and when they brought their trucks back and assembled their grids, they made a grisly discovery. My father refused to tell me what had been found until I was much older. Sitting on top of the pole where Frith had once been was my aunt's severed head, her milky eyes still filled with a cosmic sort of horror, like she'd seen the very devil she preached so adamantly about. Laid out on the ground in front of it was a blood-soaked Bible, the same Bible that my aunt had made us read innumerable times. Every single line of text in the entire book was indecipherable except for one verse. So they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Shortly after that, we were packing things away and into boxes and loading them into our father's truck. After some slight pressing, my brother admitted to our father what our aunt had done to us. There were many emotions, and all of them crowded over one another for center stage, Despair at losing his sister, I mean, really, losing her in a way that death can't hold a candle to. Guilt for not seeing the bruises on Jacob or the unspoken pleas in our eyes on the rare occasions that he'd leave his room. Sadness that the love of his life was not there to advise him on where to go next or what to do now. But the greatest of these was rage. 
a boiling fury at the attempted murder of his children at the hands of someone he trusted. That anger has never fully gone away. We left town two days after the funeral. To this day, Frith's motives are still unclear to me. It's possible the Scarecrow was some sort of unorthodox protector. I'd been an only friend to it, and it was returning the favor. Maybe it was never something to be feared. But sometimes, I find myself looking up places that I've been in early hours in the morning, and Google takes me to that little village. Each time I see the slowly increasing amount of missing persons reports, it's hard not to feel that Frith was a hair of a darker color. Over the last few months, my friends and I found a new favorite hobby. Exploring abandoned places. It was during one of these searches for an abandoned place that we found a weird little town by the name of Morthen. It was only about a 30-minute drive from our town, which was very shocking to us considering that we had never heard of this place. We had started our journey planning to head to an abandoned hospital about an hour away, but Google Maps led us through Morthen which intrigued us enough that we decided that we had to make a few stops. For such a tiny town, it had quite a lot of popular chain stores and restaurants, which also made us wonder how we had not heard of it sooner. In the town we came from, which was considerably bigger, didn't even have some of these places. As we pulled up to a red light, Google Maps told us to take a left, but my friend Jamie nearly lost her shit over a huge Starbucks taking up residence in the parking lot to the left of the red light. Upon her insistence, we absolutely had to stop at the Nova Bucks, as she began to jokingly call it, due to its size. And we'd never seen one that large. And it had a rather unique look to it, really. The overwhelming size ended up being because it was placed in an old factory-type building. It looked pretty interesting from the outside, with the Starbucks sign nestled on a splotch of brick wall between an assortment of windows. The inside was a completely different feeling compared to the wonders of the exterior. The design choice, seemingly an attempt at vintage charm, looked interesting on the outside, but ended up coming off as rather dark and dreary, even with all the windows. Just thinking back, the building itself wasn't the only thing off about Nova Bucks. At the time, we just chalked it up to teenagers running the place and unhappy customers, but it was something more. The smell of the place, rather awakening at all other Starbucks, just seemed fake. Like those imitation coffee-scented candles that never quite got the smell right. It took quite a while for us to order our coffees once we got inside due to the long lines. Once we made it to the register, we were disappointed when the barista repeatedly told us they were out of X, Y, and Z every time we asked for a certain drink. We ended up getting rather plain Jane coffees, but that ended up being the least of our concerns. The main thing piquing our interest was how... how... dead the customers seemed. Now, there were quite a few customers waiting for coffees besides us, but they all acted like zombies. I mean, I could possibly understand the way that they were acting if it was, if it was the early morning... But it was well past lunchtime, and not only that, but all the mannerisms were the same. They stared off into the same direction, appearing lost in thought until their name was called. When they would then approach the counter with matching speed walk and thanking the barista in the same monotone voice before leaving. It was very eerie. So we were more than ready to get our coffees and leave. We decided it might be fun to scope out the town and see what other places they might have. As we left the parking lot and kept going straight through the red light, another huge building caught our attention. The sign, simply reading Mall, from the top of the building intrigued us, seemingly quirky at first. I pulled into the parking lot, avoiding a few potholes and less than perfect asphalt. The building itself seemed in decent shape, however, so we didn't pay too much attention to its surroundings. Water filled the little craters, and probably from a previous rain making it look like mini ponds. As I passed one, I glanced at it as I did, and I could have sworn... I could have sworn I saw my reflection staring back at me with a sinister grin. I, I did a double take. 
but when I looked back, my reflection was back to normal. I shook my head, running off the paranoid thoughts and decisions that it was just my brain mistaking things. Thinking back on that instance, I'm... I'm not sure if it was just a mistake. The building seemed normal enough to us at first, until we saw a map detailing the stores within the building. Now, it was definitely the strangest layout for a mall we'd ever been to, but it had three floors worth of stores that we mostly loved. We headed to our usual stops, Hot Topic, Spencer's, Claire's, etc. They all seemed relatively normal besides the layouts being, well, kind of outdated, and the customers displaying the same energy as the ones in the Nova Box. We noticed the cashiers seemed a bit dead too, but we just ignored it, noticing that we had spent way too long within the mall and in Morthens in general. So we decided Bath and Body Works would be our last stop before we left. One of my friends, Allison, had told us that they were having a sale, so we excitedly scurried over to the fragrance shop. Fall was coming up when this happened, and I so badly wanted a new scented candle that matched the tone of the season. When we entered the store, we didn't see the usual front of the store setup most of the recently released fragrance lines had, which, I mean, we thought was rather odd. We also didn't notice any signs about the sale that Allison had mentioned, so Jamie headed off towards the cashier station to ask about it. Allison and I walked through the aisles of perfumes, both eventually giving each other confused looks when we noticed that all the fragrances were from previous years, some even no longer sold in stores or online. Now, we thought it was odd, but we also were eager that we might have found a Bath & Body Works jackpot. We began testing out the perfumes, spraying them on the testing papers, and swapping ones we both found nostalgia in. It had been a few minutes since Jamie went off in search of a worker. We could see from where we were that the register station looked empty of any workers. Or Jamie. We began to worry, but it was about this time that our workers seemed to materialize out of nowhere. Allison waved in her direction, and the worker began to head our way. As she approached us, I noticed something strange with her mouth. She had black lipstick on, but that, I mean, that wasn't the problem. The problem was the way it was shaped. And had she lined them that way on purpose? It, it looked bumpy, which had me convinced for a moment. Maybe it was just a deformity until she got closer. That's whenever I could make out the stitch holding... Her mouth closed. I instantly grabbed my friend's arm, latching on so hard that she complained that it was hurting her before turning away from the perfume display to see what was wrong. We both froze as she got closer, unsure of what to do. I, I could see she had a frantic look on her face. Fear. But I was too afraid to do anything. I, mean, I don't know if she wanted our help or if it was us that she was scared of, but I also didn't get to find out. Jamie had finally returned at that moment and shoved us down the aisle and away from the girl. We sprinted out of the store as soon as we left the aisle, making it back to the car in record time and very much out of breath. As I unlocked the doors, Allison realized she still had a perfume bottle in her hands. Should I bring it back? She wondered out loud. Are you out of your mind? Asked Jamie. Hell no! Without hesitation, she quickly snatched it out of Allison's hands and threw it in a pothole full of water. A loud beating noise cut across the parking lot at that moment, like something drumming against a surface. We looked back towards the front windows, looking into the mall, and saw all the cashiers that helped us today were there now, each rhythmically slamming their hands against the glass, blood spatter beginning to decorate and smear the windows, along with cracks that increased with each smash of their hands. Customers began to join the line, and I couldn't tear my eyes away from their expressions. The complete lack of emotion as they, as they severely injured themselves. It wasn't until a few of them dropped to the ground, too hurt to continue, that Jamie broke us out of our trance and yelled for us to get the hell out of there. I had no problem with obliging, and so we quickly left, practically zooming out of the parking lot on two wheels. I didn't even care about my car possibly getting damaged because of the pond potholes, as long as we got away from that hellish place. We didn't make any more stops in Morthen that day. I was glad about that because, because of what my friends told me later. While my eyes were too focused on our path to safety, Allison and Jamie were able to see that every single store we passed, including Novabox, had a straight line of workers and customers in their parking lot watching us leave. And we were so shaken up about the experience that we just decided to head home instead of to the abandoned hospital. 
all agreeing to spend the night at my house watching movies as a distraction. I don't think any of us wanted to be alone, especially with the dead expression of the customers and cashiers as they smashed their heads still fresh in our minds. When we finally made it to my house, we unloaded our shopping bags from the car, placed them on the dining room table rather carefully, afraid of any artifacts from the horrible place. After going through them, we were shocked to find that all the items we bought were damaged and dirty, like, like they were items that we would find in our normal explorations of abandoned places that were taken care of. The items smelled like rot and mold, so strong that it made us gag. Stark contrast from how we saw them in the store when we bought them, which, which might have been the most confusing thing about the whole experience. I mean, even if Morthen didn't seem to exist, we'd still brought things home from there, things that didn't make any sense. It was while we were discussing how we ended up with these damaged goods that Jamie suddenly sprinted out of the garage door into my car. She came back in covering her mouth in an attempt to not throw up. She held her Starbucks cup in her hand, held out as far away from her face as her arm could reach. She'd forgotten about hers in the car when we went inside the mall, and Allison and I had drunk the rest of ours while window shopping, tossing the cups into one of the trash cans inside the mall. But remembering us finishing our drinks made me gag as I looked at Jamie's cup, which was just as dirty and outdated as the things that we had brought home from the mall. Well, that wasn't what was making Jamie and I nearly throw up, however. The contents of the cup, a dark brown sludge with chunks of something floating in it, the cause of us nearly upchucking on my dining room tiled floor. Allison, always the less squeamish one of the bunch, took it out of her hand and brought it over to the kitchen counter, careful not to spill or drop it. I saw her looking around and I, I reached into the cabinet to grab what I was assuming she wanted, a bowl. And now she motioned for us to cover our noses the best that we could before quickly dumping the sludge into the bowl and unleashing the most god-awful smell we had ever experienced. It literally smelt like rotting flesh, making Jamie and I throw up instantly. The smell of vomit mixing with the stench only made it worse, especially once we saw the content of our vomit from the previously consumed drinks. We quickly realized chunks floating in the bowl of sludge and occupying our vomit were chunks of bone and human fingers. And that discovery is what finally made Allison throw her squeamishness out the window and completely and immediately throw up in the kitchen sink. To this day, we've never been able to find this town again. Not that we really wanted to. We had tried to tell people about our experience, however, and we'd had had a fair amount of people ask us if we were under the influence, simply because the place, according to maps of all kinds, did not exist. We just couldn't find any trace of the strange town. We'd already thrown away the things that we brought from there. But who would believe us if we showed them a dirty clothing item anyway? You'd think that we were insane. I mean, we, we looked through bank statements to see if any mention of the town was in our purchases, but, but our purchases hadn't even shown up. No money was removed. I mean, we even debated showing the cops the bone and fingers, but it only took a few hours for the sludge to completely disintegrate whatever human chunks it had contained. After a few years of no one believing us, we, we got tired of sounding crazy or of people thinking that we were lying. I mean, this is probably the last time I'll ever tell the story of the town of Morthen. So I decided to make it a warning. Whatever you do, if more than ever suddenly appears on whatever map that you're currently using, don't go to it. We made it out safely, but, but you might not be so lucky. Who among us wasn't horrified to find out that there was a mass of plastic and garbage roughly the size of Texas floating around in the Pacific Ocean? And of course, none of us would have suspected that in the midst of all that trash, the plastic, and the toxic waste, something even more sinister was brewing. 
and coalescing. Something terrible was churning and bubbling beneath the surface, and the guts of the great Pacific garbage patch, like a bowl of toads tossed into a witch's cauldron. The aquatic life was being slowly changed and broken down, and then rebuilt again into something different. And I may be the only one on Earth who's seen it face to face and lived to tell about it. Pray that you never do. When I first found out about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, I did a lot of research. I watched videos of how it was affecting marine life and how turtles and fish were getting caught up in the stuff. I researched the microbeads and PFAs, those forever plastics that never disappear. They can't be broken down, so they linger in our bodies and the bodies of animals, causing cancer and other issues. And after I lost my job last year, I decided, well, I wanted to help. I had a bit of money in my savings and unemployment checks were coming in to help supplement my income, so I decided to take a break from the daily grind and go do something big to help the planet. I mean, why should the generations after us have to clean up our mess, I thought. The least I could do was help. There was a number of potential organizations I could volunteer with, but I found one in particular that seemed to have a need for my skill set. I'd been diving since I was a teenager, so when I saw one group that needed a scuba diver for their plastic cleaning up operation, I signed up right away. Months and months of training and hard work later, I found myself standing on the deck of a large vessel heading out towards the heart of the Pacific Ocean. I was one of the only few greenhorns, as they would call us, who had never really been out on an operation of this magnitude. Another diver had been training me to do the sort of work that would be expected of us. His name was Bill, and he was a Navy vet who had been out multiple times doing similar cleanup jobs. Despite his hard gray eyes and stern gaze, I found out he was a pretty nice guy once you got to know him. The term teddy bear was used to describe him more than once, as if to alleviate my noticeable jitters. Although I'd yet to see that side of him, I got the feeling that he could always tear your heart out in an instant if you made a mistake that jeopardized someone's safety, so I was always on my toes around him. Once we get out there, I need you to listen to me closely, he was saying on the fourth or fifth time. Any miscommunication could be the difference between life and death. I know, Bill. I mean, come on, man. You told me this like ten times. Relax. Enjoy the view. See the dolphins down there? The silver sheen of their dorsal fins could be seen breaking the surface of the water occasionally as they hopped on the waves alongside the bow. I was the Navy kid. Seen a lot of dolphins, he said, his gaze telling me that he wasn't impressed. Now if you spot a sea lion, let me know. Seriously though, I'm just trying to make sure that you get back safe, Jake. Just listen carefully when we're out there, okay? Watch for my hand signals. Do exactly what I say when I say it. Okay, okay, I get it. I listened to him lecture for a little while longer, and then we went down to the galley for dinner. By morning, we would arrive at our destination and the work would begin. What we didn't realize was that not all of us would be making it back. Make a break time, Jake, Bill was saying as we prepared to drop backwards into the water from our dinghy. Our wetsuits were on and our scuba equipment had been checked and double-checked. The water looked dark, almost black, so far out in the depths of the Pacific. The gray, overcast skies made it seem even more so. Nets were being drawn across a vast stretch that would capture plastic and garbage, but only at the top few feet of the water level. Below that, the fish and other aquatic life would easily be able to escape beneath. The system had been devised so that no marine creatures would be killed or injured by our nets. Our job was to ensure that it was working as it had been designed to function. Okay. Three, two, one. Dive, 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 Bill said, when we dropped backwards into the water. I was slightly nervous, but also excited as we dropped below the surface and got our first look around. Our equipment was designed to prevent any of the microplastics or other contaminants into our equipment, but there was still a risk diving into the water out there. I mean, who knew what nasty shit could be floating in the great Pacific garbage patch after all? We'd find out soon enough. 
The huge nets were slowly drawn around the chosen area, creating a loop. The nets tightened, bringing debris together in a circle so it could be pulled up into the boats. As we watched from beneath the surface, we were told to try and monitor for wildlife getting caught up in the nets, and to attempt to free those creatures if possible. I saw a sea tortoise getting stuck up at one point, and untangled it with an effort from the nets, setting it free. It swam away without looking back. The technology worked as efficiently as could be expected, and pretty soon everything began to coalesce into a central area called the Collection Zone. There, the nets converged into a sock shape so that the debris could be brought into the boats. I stayed towards the periphery, careful not to get caught up in the closing loop of the inner nets near the Collection Zone. And suddenly I noticed something in the netting around me. It was a strange-looking creature. Like a black worm of some kind. At least that's what I thought at first. But then I saw it was bisected in places, split like branches on a tree. But the tree branch things were moving. They were moving towards me. I suddenly realized that this creature was closing in on me, and it was made of many legs and crooked appendages. Spindly, thin, knobby, long legs. They were so strange looking I had mistaken them at first for oil slick, seaweed, or some other kind of debris. I tried to hand signal Bill, but he didn't notice me at first. He was close enough to me that I could just swim over to him and tap his shoulder. He was maybe twenty feet away from me. Kicking my legs, I began heading over in his direction. Then suddenly, I felt something grab onto me. Something thin and vine-like wrapped around my thigh like a whip, digging into my flesh, causing me to cry out in pain. The regulator slipped from my mouth and caused the disgusting garbage water to flow in for a moment as I howled in pain. And quickly, I shoved the regulator back into my mouth and took a deep, grateful breath of air. Looking down at my leg, it, it took me a moment to see what was causing the sudden discomfort. It's one of those strange, spindly black legs, I realized. It looked like something from a massive alien spider, intersected with knobby bits. It extended back into the midst of the trash patch, where more of it could be seen here and there. And then suddenly, it began to pull me in. I felt like a great fish being reeled in, pulled in the opposite direction that the nets were going. Grabbing desperately for anything nearby, I stuck my fingers through the net that had been collecting the garbage. It was sturdy, being drawn in by the trawlers on the surface. There was a moment of give. But then I felt myself being pulled in two different directions by unstoppable forces. Above, the boats were reeling in the net, and below, this thing, whatever it was, was pulling me towards it into the depths of the ocean, away from the crew. Fighting back a scream once more, my mind raced, trying to figure out what to do. I tried to telepathically call out to Bill, yelling but unable to loudly vocalize it underwater. Bill! Help! My muffled screams became a garbled, bubbling jumble. And once again, he didn't turn around. Despite all his talk of looking out for me and the dangers beneath the surface of the ocean, he hadn't looked in my direction for a good couple of minutes. He looked busy fiddling with something stuck in the nets. A fish, I realized. Son of a bitch was more concerned with a damn fish than saving my life. I screamed again, this time louder into the water. It went unheard, muffled by the rocking motion of the waves and the clunk, clunk, clunk of the nets, full of trash. I had a knife in my pocket, so I reached down and I grabbed it, wincing at the pain and looking up desperately to see if Bill had noticed me struggling yet. He hadn't. My hand dove down to my leg, and with a serrated knife I began to saw at the wiry tentacle arm which held me. It felt like I was trying to cut through a steel cable. It only tightened further until my leg felt like it would be squeezed from my body. Holding onto the netting, I began to feel my fingers slipping. Desperately, I clung to it with every ounce of strength I had. The thing pulling me was so strong. More of the tentacle arm was slowly finger-walking towards me, coming from a singular direction, I realized. And then... And then I, I saw what was at the center of it. A great, black, spider-like creature was slowly making a course through the trash, heading in my direction. Unlike any ordinary spider, this creature was massive. It had a countless multitude of long, spindly legs. It strode along the surface of the net towards me, and I saw it was made up of those individual strands of oily vines. It was as if this creature was a scribbled monster drawn in black marker by an angry child. It made no sense. It hurt my brain just to look at it and panicking. I, I tried desperately to unwrap it from my leg, using the knife to try to dig between the layers of it coiled around my thigh. He was unyielding and impossible to dig past the surface or, or even get a millimeter of give to try and unwrap it. The thing felt like a steel coil as it squeezed and bit into my flesh through the wetsuit. I screamed again, this time not for help but out of sheer agony. 
the pitch of it rising and rising as the regulator fell out of my mouth yet again. This time, though. This time, it wasn't an accident. The coiling black vine grabbed the mouthpiece and pulled it away from me, out of my grasp, yanking the hose free from the air tank with unbelievable force. The spider creature was getting closer, now dropping down beneath me, and desperately, desperately, I tried to swim to the surface, no longer thinking, just panicking and screaming as the thing wrapped tighter and tighter around my thigh. Bill was suddenly there below me. I realized with a moment of relief. He immediately began to pull on the tentacle leg, dragging me down from below, trying to create slack so I could try to unravel myself. It, it, it worked! With the sudden break in the creature's strong grasp, I managed to pry the coiling length of it from my leg with a knife and I felt a rush of blood and oxygen go through my limb as it throbbed and prickled with pins and needles. After a few moments of desperately unwinding and unraveling it from my leg, I was finally free. But Bill... Bill was another story. Right after he freed me, the thing wrapped itself around him like a huge squid with a, with a fish for a meal. It, it embraced him with a thousand arms, it dragged him downward with the black, oily tentacles. His wide eyes looked terrified, and I heard his scream cut through the water and rise bubbling up to my ears. I tried to swim down to Bill, but he was suddenly too far below me to be seen clearly. He was disappearing into the black depths of the ocean, I realized. My heart beating fast with fear, the appendages which had been slowly maneuvering towards me began to head towards a new target instead, the one down below to Bill. The poor man was being dragged down to the dark blackness of the ocean. Kicking with my flippers, I raced down to try and save him. I managed to descend with an effort for a few moments, but then quickly lost sight of him, and more importantly, more importantly, I... I lost my nerve. With no air and no sight of him, I had no hope of catching him. Not to mention there was no way I could fight that creature by myself. Suddenly, the imperative need for air hit me and I began to swim up towards the surface. Tentacles of the creature were connecting it from the dark depths to the garbage patch as if feeding off of it, taking nourishment from the poisonous mass. I mean, Bill could hold his breath for a long time. Perhaps, perhaps we could still find him, I thought to myself foolishly. Even by then, I knew. I knew he was a goner. I swam back to the surface and I took a gasping breath of air, calling for help as I still felt terrified at the black tendrils floating nearby. Now I knew how quickly it could move and how strong it truly was. I was more afraid than ever before in my life as I thrashed and I screamed at the surface, calling out for help. By the time the boat got close enough to pull me in, it was... It was far too late for Bill. The official cause of death was ruled a diving accident. But I knew the truth. My attempts to tell others what had really happened were met with ridicule and remarks on how I hadn't been prepared enough. People seemed to blame me for the accident. People... Someone told the investigators the last thing they had seen was Bill swimming towards me as, as it looked as if I had gotten tangled up in the netting somehow. The whole thing came out, making it look like Bill had somehow lost his life as a result of my incompetence. No matter what I say, nobody listens to me. But I need to get this out to the world. I need everyone to understand. Okay, there's something sinister living in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, feeding off the toxins and the deadly plastics, taking nourishment from the things which make us sick. And whatever it is, it's getting bigger. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thanks so much for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. For those of you that want to hear more than just me, there's also a new app out called Chilling. The Chilling app is currently available on Android and on iOS, and it has new and exclusive stories just for the app done by myself and many, many other narrators. More importantly, I think that the coolest thing about it is the ambience feature that allows you to set your own tone and background sounds and music. 
as the app calls itself. It's a more intense way to relax. And as always, I want to give a big thank you to all of my contributors on Patreon. You guys are the real MVP. You guys keep the lights on here and allow me to do a whole bunch of cool things like exclusive stories and a very special thank you to all of the big skeleton patrons, such as Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Brian Ars, Bobby Carmen, Stephanie Butler, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Mask Note, Rashad Collins, Joshua Mullen, Zavium, Dan Pham, Matthew McNeese, Shelly J, Ben Spates, Anna Storm, Jeremy H, Raltazal, Nana, The Morgan, Diamondella, Melted Lake, Tully Sue, William King, Reaper 61167, Darth Miver, Michael Ortiz, Satanic Aries, I Soda Hatred, Nessie, Parafa Panda, Bardo Hawk 764, Melancholy Corpse, Ferb, Lambda M98, Harley, Billy Morrow, Sashi Sazaku, at Grizzly Olsen Pro, Caden the Spooky Boy, Zane Nightshade, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Lord of the Weebs, Jay, Miss Alexandra, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Azarine Fox, Fried Chicken 12, Freddy Krueger, Michael Scarborough, Happy Birthday, Jason Wilson, Infernal One, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Tommy Green, Fester Lampshade, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, Raphael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, Trace Miles, and Corey Kenshin. Thank you guys so much for being a part of Patreon, and for everybody who's down there in the description, and everybody who even contributes just one dollar to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. And, as always, my friends, sweet dreams.